This is the Backlot 605 Podcast, and it is now time for another interview from the Backlot. Welcome to the Backlot 605 Podcast. I am one of your hosts. I'm Casey Calderman. Join with me, as always, is my co-host, Brian Menson. What's up? What's up, Brian? How you doing? Uh, I'm here live in the studio for once. You are for, I think we figured out for the first time since summer 2020, which was seven and a half years ago. That's quite a long time. <laughs> right. We were talking baseball. We were talking baseball. That's right. Uh, that's how long it's been. It's been too long. Uh, it's good to be back in here. We're kind of loosening up. We'll still probably do most of the main shows on on, on uh, StreamYard and, and from your house and from my house. But for today, we have a special interview and we thought... You know, why not do this one in person? Because we have a fellow Sioux Falls resident, a Sioux Falls filmmaker, uh, Dewey Nordsman. Welcome to the show, Dewey. How are you? Thanks. Uh, I'm good. Good. (laughs) It's nice to have human interaction again. Right. Yeah. So. What is this human person thing in front of me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm still looking at a computer screen because (laughs) I can't see you guys. Uh, The the, the failures of, of technology. Yeah, the failures of you need to figure out a better process. Need a tiny monitor. That's what I need here. Uh, but we're joined. Dewey came on because I, I asked him because I saw your film, uh, Duende, at the Dancing Spider Film Festival, which was held. Uh, was that in October or September? September. I September. Yeah. Uh, in Laverne, Minnesota. I had the chance to watch the film there. Um, and, and I thought this is a, a perfect time because your film is also debuting at the Black Hills Film Festival uh, this next couple couple of weeks going on here as they go online. Um, let's kind of just start there with, with that. What has the, the, festival, the, the festival run uh, been looking like? Because I know this is uh, the second South Dakota Film Festival that you guys have entered. Also online was the South Dakota Film Festival. And then yeah. you've got to be uh, you know in person for Dancing Spider. What's... What's the festival run been like for the film this time around? Um, uh, I don't know. I can't say that anything has been like normal because this is my first um, film that I've ever had at any sort of film festival, let alone three festivals. So um, the it, it's very similar, I would say, uh, as South Dakota Film Festival was going through Black Hills Film Festival. They both went online. They're both virtual. Um, and so this kind of, this time around is kind of like, okay, now there's something that feels the same, feels kind of normal, um, even though it's not normal for them to be holding anything online. Picked a good year for it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was, it's been weird for me to have, cause I keep, uh, talking with people from the festival and they're like, well, normally, you know, how film festivals go is like this. I'm like, no, I don't know what normally looks like cause my first time through. And so this is normal for me being online and virtual having it screened that way so yeah yeah like brian said i think that's kind of a great way to introduce it this year then is that you're just going straight online then you don't have to have the preconceived notions of going to the festival and yeah maybe doing mm-hmm. a q a or anything like that you know you're kind of just jumping in like uh it almost feels like a good way to like dip your foot into the water mm-hmm. without going full all the way in you know yeah. in terms of like if you would have to like say travel to like say Aberdeen or you know Laverne or whatever the case is depending on where the festival would be quote unquote be at and I'd be like all right I can do this from the comfort of my house that's true that's true yeah I I will say though it it is a little little bit of a letdown because I was looking forward to like maybe traveling to some of those places but um it's definitely a lot easier Mm -hmm. to do it this way and you don't have to travel to Rapid City when it's negative 20 degrees outside oh yeah so that's nice I guess yeah that would have been awful (laughs) I would have been like, can I uh, just phone it in? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it online, just me this, this time. Yeah. Uh, let's let's talk about your movie though, because you are you, you know you shot the movie in South Dakota, correct? Where yes. where in South Dakota did you guys shoot the movie? Uh, in Garrison, out at Palisades Park, so just on the border there. Um, and it was just kind of in an ambiguous area of that state park where it could have been anywhere, I guess. Uh, Cause I wanted it to feel like it was anywhere in the Midwest where there was forest and in South Dakota, finding a forested area was very difficult. So went to the nearest one and there it was. So <laughs> We don't, we don't know what forests are right. in South Dakota, yeah. but that's, what's nice about it though, too, is the fact that you can still film it here, but you know, 
it, it almost feels like it could be almost anywhere. Like if you're talking about like say Colorado or any place that has, uh, you know, afforestation and whatnot. So people could still relate to it, even though they're not necessarily from South Dakota. Yeah. I grew up in Wisconsin, so there's just woods all around. And so anytime I'm thinking up stories, I don't know, I'm just influenced from growing up. I, I was in the woods all the time. So every thing I come up with is like in a small town in the woods somewhere. So kind of like a, a mothman feel for everything. But like I was, I was rewatching it here th this morning, and you know, just the, from the opening, it feels like I almost thought to myself, this kind of looks like California in a way, just the way you open up the film in the forest, because like, it's true. I mm -hmm. think it could have taken place in northern, you know, California too. Sure. And I, I think that's one of the great things about South Dakota, f as far as our landscape. Yeah. Your movie isn't really set in South Dakota. You can be anywhere in the United States because of our vast terrain here. Mm -hmm. It's true. Those opening shots were actually in the Black Hills. So I took both sides of the state and put it in. So, yeah. Um, one, one thing I do want to talk about here is the story of this, because if you want to go ahead and explain the story of the film and we'll kind of get into the mythology of it too, because that's something I want to, I want to touch on with you. Right. Uh, so basically, uh, it's just, uh, a dad and his kids on a camping trip and, uh, He's trying to engage with them, interact. So he wants to tell kind of a, a story from his childhood that he likes to tell at every camping outing uh, and trying to engage his youngest kid. And so he kind of tells this story of uh, this creature that he encountered when he was their age and the curse it set on them. And so um, as the film progresses, we see that it gets a little uh, too real, that story does. So. Uh, and, that, and that's the, the majority of it. Uh, the the youngest kid ends up uh, encountering a little bit more than just a story. So, not to give it away, I don't know. Do, yeah. do you guys give stuff away here? So should I just like tell uh, everything to the end? I don't, I don't, I don't know. To... I don't like giving away things no, for no, no. people. We we would if we're if spoilers are going to be said, we'd rather be coming from the guy that made it, not from the not the people that watched it. Blame it on me. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> and I want to give people a chance to watch this too, because this is a movie where. If you know everything that's, you know, especially with a short, if you give it all away, you're going to know everything that's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But with the story as keeping it as vague as we can, what are some like mythologies or stories you guys kind of took from to, and, and as far as writing the story? Yeah. So uh, Eduardo, who's the dad in the film, he helped me write it and translate my script. And um, we basically d dove into Bolivian folktales, like what are monsters from Bolivia that, we can use and it was uh you'd think it was like some sort of really intimate like he knew a lot of stuff from childhood but we just really did like a google search it was not very technical or very like in-depth like oh we know all of this like deep cultural stuff uh even though he's from bolivia uh we still just kind of google searched some monsters and we settled on the duende you know the film's namesake so um yeah that's where it landed and uh the story he does tell uh, in the film is a story uh, from uh, his childhood in a way. Uh, his friends would prank younger kids by telling them they had a duende locked up in their attic. And so they would build it up and then they, one of their friends would like hide, you know, all wrapped up in a dirty cloth or something in the attic in the dark corner. And they bring the little kids up there and then scare them that way. And so it was kind of derivative of that actual story. So. A little bit of truth to it, in a way. He answered one of my questions. I was going to ask him. He just like you know, because you know, you wonder if if this was something that was based off of someone's actual, you know, because mm -hmm. the the way the story opens up, it's him telling a story. So the first question I had was, you know, is it based off of a story like you grew up with, story he grew up with, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so it almost sounds like it's a combination of something, uh, a real life experience mixed in with how can we make a good short film out of it here yeah, yeah. and sure. google's everybody's friend because yeah. <laughs> i i was trying to write up like a scary story that he would tell and it just wasn't working for me i couldn't come up with anything i'm um, sorry sorry uh, sir <laughs> um and so you know he just ended up sharing that with us when we were going through stuff and uh, i was like well let's just use that because that's way better and He's a good storyteller, um, you know, an oral storyteller himself. He does that. He 
likes doing that. So I'm like, we're going to use that skill of yours and have you just tell a story that you already know. Makes it more organic. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And that, that's one thing I love about like, like uh, sh short films, especially is you can take kind of folklore type stories or stories you told it to each other as kids or things that happened to you in childhood that maybe lean them tell uh, themselves more towards a, a short form storytelling. Because mm -hmm. like, I remember as a kid in elementary school, I would have this, I think we all had this, a creepy friend in school that just had all these weird, crazy stories. I think we all had that friend. And I would always go up to him during a, a recess and be like, what's a, what's a scary story you can tell me? Like, what happened in your house last night? Anything scary happen? It always feels like we all uh, have had that friend. And that's what this, yeah. the, the story the dad tells in this feels like is that type mm -hmm. of story that's been passed down through generations. Or you heard it from your cousin. Your cousin heard it from his dad. And his dad, you know, his grandpa told it to him a long time ago. It's just those stories that are passed down all the time, mm -hmm. dude. Was that something you guys kind of took into it too? Is that the the generational type of storytelling or like uh, word of mouth type of stories like that? Yeah, I'd say that's definitely a part of it. Um, I don't know how often that story got recycled through their family, per that, that specific one in the short. But um, yeah, that was kind of the idea, I think, behind it is trying to, like he's trying to do that in the film anyway. So with his kids and get them to get into that as well so you said you're from wisconsin correct yeah that's where i'm born and raised so how did how did you end up in south dakota then? oh man it's a it's a kind of a long story but to make it short uh i moved to tennessee for music so i went to music college and uh, primarily for drums why does anybody do that i don't know but i did um and while i was in memphis i ended up uh meeting my wife online. And so we had this long distance relationship for like a year and a half. I was in Memphis and she was here in Sioux Falls. And it just became uh, too much for me to just stay in Memphis and nothing was happening. I was like trying to get film stuff done. I was trying to get music stuff done and just, uh, it's a rich town full of really talented people. And mm -hmm. I wasn't really making it not that Sioux Falls isn't either, um, but it's just uh, a different dynamic. It is a very different dynamic in Memphis. There's just so many um, people. And so I, I moved up here to be with my wife primarily. And I just was like, I'll just keep doing movie stuff on the side and music on the side. And um, yeah, so that's how I ended up here is because of her. She's the one that drew me up here. But also, it's really nice to just be closer to family than when I was in Memphis. Um, my family's still in Wisconsin, but it's a shorter trip from Wisconsin. But it's so much Wisconsin. warmer down in Tennessee. You should have told her to come down. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to be said. As for I'm somebody saying. who's lived in this state for 30 plus years, I sit there going, why am I still here every winter? Right. And well, when I was in Tennessee, I was in Memphis, you know, everyone's like, oh, you came from Tennessee. It's a beautiful state. Yeah. The West or the East half of the state is pretty. The East half of the state is not. And then so I moved to South Dakota where the West half of the state is pretty and the East half of the state is just, oh, it's okay. We're so okay. I'm living in the boring parts of the states that I moved to. Well, that's okay with me. <laughs> but what about filmmaking? Was that always something you were always into and always wanted to, to, to be a filmmaker? Yeah. I mean, uh, at least from my time in college, once I got to college and I was doing more of music, um, I started really getting into video and filmmaking just with my friends in college. You know, it's kind of how it starts for a lot of people, I think, is just like, yeah, we just want to make stupid videos. And there's a lot of stupid videos that are out there that my friends and I made. Um, but in the midst of that, I was like, I kind of want to make something that is genuine. So I actually made a short film when I was in Memphis, um, kind of the last man on earth based on that short story that everyone's heard a million times uh last man on earth sits in a room alone and hears a knock on the door and so i just really liked that and uh made a short film there and then that kind of just sparked everything else it's like i gotta keep making more and i want them to be better and uh i hadn't made anything since that short film like that was in 2012 and uh it was just my perfectionistic leaning that says I, it needs to be better <laughs> than the last thing um but i'm starting to let go of those a little bit just so things can actually get made mm -hmm. so yeah what are, what are some of the uh like films or filmmakers that you kind of grew up with and kind of influenced you in, in your work and stuff um growing up steven spielberg was a huge 
a director, I think for maybe a lot of, a lot of people he was, um, just cause he was the kind of the blockbuster. Anybody who grew up in like eighties and nineties. Yeah. yeah. He, I mean, he was the biggest name yeah. and my, my dad uh, loved uh, Steven Spielberg films too. So I grew up watching Indiana Jones and uh, Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And they were just all my favorite films um, from the, the time I grew up. And uh, it was just, film was more from, in that period, Steven Spielberg was more of like, I enjoyed watching these films. And then as soon as I got into making films, um, I, my like who influenced me as a director kind of changed a little bit. I started getting more into art films. So like really weird uh, stuff like with David Lynch and David Cronenberg, David, fin all the Davids, right? <laughs> They're the, the, the big filmmakers mm -hmm. that do the weird stuff that push boundaries. And I got inspired by that and really like the way they can tell a story and somehow some of like make it rewatchable and keep it ambiguous at the same time. And uh, I want to try to be able to do that as well if I can. So, you know, you mentioned some of the, the, you know, the Davids, the ones that are, are pushing the boundaries of, 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 of filmmaking and stuff. What are some of the, the films that have really like, like, was there a certain movie that you watched where you're like, boom, I want to make movies like that. Was there anything like that? Like uh, that spark that just went off in your head? Oh, uh, make movies like that. Because uh, I was going to say, did you have anything that would like maybe have helped influence this one? Oh, man. Um yeah, now I'm going to lean more away from the Davids into some horror um, directors because that's who I'm started leaning into lately, especially with Duende. Um, James Wan was a big uh, influence for horror films for me and just how he did, how he made horror films. And then um, uh, Ari Aster as well. Just those those filmmakers and uh, for at least horror films, they've become more influential. And Duende, man, I, I can't even... I don't know if I can specifically nail down a specific person that influenced that one um, besides the people that actually helped make it. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of people that are influencing me immediately right now, those are the two biggest directors. I love James Wan and how I remember just reading something or seeing an interview with him where he just, when he's coming up with ideas, he sits in a room all by himself pitch black and thinks what would be the scariest thing that could happen to me right now I'm like oh, i just really like that for some reason just likes to put himself in those horrific situations and bring those to life that's how we get aquaman <laughs> <laughs> he just saw that terrible cgi and said what's the scariest yeah. <laughs> thing i can put into this uh so you, you said you're getting really into like horror movies right now especially mm -hmm. when you know Duende is a horror movie mm -hmm. is that a genre you've always always loved and, and have have gone to. I know Brian's rolling his eyes at me asking a horror question, but you or never, 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 never comes up with. Me. Yeah, I mean, horror is a is a genre that I've really come to like a lot, um, and so uh, it started more in uh, college because growing up, my mom would tell you that anything horror, even a trailer on TV, would scare the crap out of me. I could not even watch a trailer for a horror movie when I was eight or nine. It would just give me nightmares for weeks. So the irony is that I'm making horror films now. Um, but it was kind of one of those things where I grew up in a household where it was like no rated R movies, can't mm -hmm. watch that kind of stuff. And so once I got to college, it was like, okay. Open the floodgates. Let it go. And the first first movie I watched was The Exorcist. And uh, man, yeah, I still, I, that's uh, one of the scariest movies to date for me still, even though it's a dated film. There's some people who are like, man, it's just so dated. I can't, eh, it's not scary for me anymore. I'm like, I still scares the crap out of me. So No, but that's also one of those kind of movies that if you didn't grow up with horror films or anything like that, like if that's your, if that's your introduction, <laughs> number one, you're, you you are certainly setting yourself up with a really high bar right um but i mean it's it's not like you went into it with some sort of like b movie low budget like awful i should i i me retract not necessarily because you can have really good low budget but like a low budget bad movie and whatnot and realize be like why would anybody watch this at least you went in with like mm. that high level appreciation for this for kind sure. of genre yeah for sure. I don't know. The Exorcist is the scariest movie of all time. And, uh, I disagree. Anyone who says different is, uh, needs to watch it. <laughs> but I'm also the guy that only just watched The Exorcist within the last, you know, 
12 months for the very first time. Oh, so really? Yeah. So that's where like when you make the mention about, about it being like dated and stuff like that. That's I, I, I almost I see that first, but I also see the appreciation, what they did, what they did when they did it, you know, right. at the time kind of stuff. So right. I have an appreciation for the film, but at the same time, too, like I don't find it as scary as other people do because I came into it, what, 60 years later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Uh. Um, well, I have a real quick question here for the sake of your film and whatnot. Did you always intend for it to be, you know? subtitle second language kind of thing as opposed to you know just the story that as it was coming out of your head just to being a full-on like english like i knew just going into it when i pulled it up to watch it here for uh for today is like obviously with a name like duende i already knew before the first words were being uttered but was that like how you was your intention to start that way or how did how did it all kind of go into that like to be a uh What's the word I'm even looking for? A foreign, basically like a foreign language film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was initially not intentional. So I had written a, um, I'd written a short. And it was like a skeletal thing. I had an outline of a family in the woods because I'm, I mean, I was just, I'm from Wisconsin, so it's in the woods. <laughs> people are there's scary things happening, but I didn't have a monster, and I didn't have people cast yet. And so this was just kind of sitting on the back burner and Eduardo uh, just approached me. He knew I was into filmmaking. He's like, Hey man, just get it done. Let's do it. I, I want to do it. So he's the one that pushed me to get it done. And so I met with him and his family and I was like, or cause he's like, just get it done. I'll be in it. Like if that's what it takes, I'll be in it. I'll ask my kids since, you know, they like acting. We'll all be in it. You know, we'll help get it done for you. And I'm like, okay, let's meet. Let's, work it out, see what we can do, set up shooting dates and everything like that. So we got together at his house. And um, when we were talking about what the monster would be, I was like, well, let's make it a little bit more personal. Since you guys are in it, you're helping me it out. You know, okay. We chose Duende. It's going to be a Bolivian thing. And in their house, they kind of have this thing where the kids speak Spanish with their dad and they speak English with their mom to keep them fluent in both languages. And so the whole time they're sitting there talking Spanish back and forth to me. And it's just so natural them talking back and forth in Spanish with their dad. I'm like, and that's what, that's how they interact with him anyways. Mm -hmm. So if I was going to have them talk in English to them, that would be like some weird Could thing for them to do. And almost so, like a control thing for you too. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's like, you have to do the way I have to, you know, the way I want to. And I didn't want to be that way. And as a, a director who, I mean, I haven't directed a lot of people. I'm not going to say I'm a, really good at directing. I wanted it to be as natural as possible. I didn't want to have to force these people um, into doing something that I didn't know how to direct them to do. So I... Instead of putting them out of their comfort zone, I put myself out of the comfort zone. I said, okay, we're going to do it in Spanish. You're going to translate my script, and that's how it's going to be. And they're like, great. We love it. And so we just ran with that. And um, some things are lost. So for those that do speak Spanish and understand it will see that there are a couple things lost in translation with the subtitles because I couldn't get them up in time. <laughs> speak a little too quick um, in the editing. But other than that, I mean, it's it translated well. So. Yeah, and you talk about how naturalistic it is, and that, that's what this movie does feel, because, I mean, even from the lighting of the movie is the campfire lighting. Like, mm -hmm. like, I, I, I dig that. That's that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I do love the naturalistic, because you are shooting out in the woods, like you said, and it's like, where are you going to get light? Well, you could do the moon, but if you're in the woods, there's trees covering you. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's just do the campfire. And, that, like, for me, like, I grew up on, like, are you afraid of the dark and telling campfire stories like mm. that? That's just perfect for a horror movie. A campfire. Is that something that you kind of like, where am I going to get my lighting? Well, there's a campfire they're sitting around. Let's just use that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, that, uh, a lot of the stories that I, I write is I've written a lot, but I haven't shot any of it. They're all in the dark and that's a really difficult, um, to film it's very difficult i mean i do not have a good camera and you'll be, probably be able to tell uh just by watching it you know there was just some issues i had with it um but we had like three battery powered tiny little lights 
uh, to help light everything. And uh, the camera was wide open and I had one lens, like I couldn't even switch out to something nicer. So the fact that it, the lighting turned out to be what it was and look halfway decent um, was a surprise to me. So that lighting was just kind of, we needed the fire because we needed the fire to light us. <laughs> so, uh, well, and, yeah. and, you know, you're in a camp, you're in a camp setting and whatnot. And it all, it would almost feel disingenuine if you didn't have one in there just because right. they're, they're out and they're camping and stuff like that. You know, you, that's just synonymous for doing something like that. So it, it works to your advantage. Yeah. Um, I will say for the sake of, you know, your if your limited use of lighting, what you can do um, for the sake of in there without giving anything away is the uh, um, the hat on the ground. Yeah. Just the, the, the backlighting, how you pull that off. I mean, I, I think, I mean, just for, again, using what you had available to you, mm -hmm. um, I think it definitely gave that bit of eeriness with not a whole lot of, you know, having to put a whole lot of, you know, use again, using what you're using. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. When we, when, when I saw this first at the at dancing spider, you know, we, we were in a, a I, I have a very mixed feeling on the setting of that, but it was perfect because we were actually underneath the stars mm -hmm. in the dark watching, you know, a campfire story movie. And a, bunch, a lot of those were a lot of horror movies that they showed at the you know, dancing spider, but. I mean, the cars passing by didn't help, but that's oh, yeah. that's that's what it was. But like underneath the stars is a great way to watch this movie too. Like, and so if people are you know gonna you know watch this online, like at, at the uh, Black Hills um, Film Festival, I say like take off you know wait till it's you know nine o'clock at night. Shut all your lights off in your house, just you and your screen. That's mm -hmm. all that should be there. Like I, I think that's how you should watch any horror movie anyway. But mm -hmm. uh, like that's a that's a perfect way to watch this movie. And I, what, what, what were your thoughts on, on Dancing Spider? You know, you said this was your, was that your first in-person festival that you attended with your film, correct? Yeah, yeah, it was. What, what was your, your thoughts, your experience on, on Dancing Spider? Man, I love Dancing Spider. I had gone the year before just to go. Um, and I really, I don't know, it's just so cool. And so I was a little disappointed we weren't in the drive-in. Yeah. But I will say it was very cool to be um, like in like along outside, uh, alongside other people. There we go. That's what I'm trying to say. And hear their reactions to it. Cause I mean, I, the only time I had watched it was by myself editing it up until that point, really. Uh, and I hadn't watched it with anybody before. So to hear other people react to it was like, Oh, that's, it was so surreal to, to have people go, oh, you know, <laughs> at mm -hmm. certain parts, but, uh, so it was really cool to experience that. I really liked it. And like you said, just being outside under the stars, it just was perfect. It looked really good the way they were able to project it too, I thought. And uh, so, yeah. yeah. Cool. We, we, we love having Zeke and, and, and his family and stuff being a, a part of the film community here, mm -hmm. having a film festival yeah. there, uh, you know, underneath the stars is, is a really cool way to present a film. And uh, yeah, the last question i have unless brian has another one is one i like to throw out there just because i think it's a fun question uh we like to pair all of our movies that we talk about with another movie because we love double features hmm. what's what's going to make a great double feature with duende like if, if, if you're watching that at the film festival and you're like man i need to watch something right after this to keep in that same type of tone what what should someone throw on we'll throw i i have ideas too i'm sure brian does too Oh man, I don't know if I have ideas right away. That's kind of a, I haven't even thought of it in that way. Are you going to go with Friday the 13th so you can go back on the camp? Back like... around the campfire. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you should have had Jason Voorhees in your movie. Um, uh, I would pair with like Blair Witch Projects because one, you're set in the woods. Two, mm -hmm. it's this urban legend type of story being mm -hmm. told. Uh, like that just feels like those two type of things just mixed mixed together. And again, like like for Blair Witch, for me, it doesn't feel like it's set in Maryland. It feels like it could be set in South Dakota. Yeah. So uh, that I and that's one of my favorite movies ever. But uh, yeah, I think that's a great like transition from one either watching your film first and then the after that and then in your film. At least you didn't go with like Tucker and Dale versus Evil. And that's, a, that's <laughs> another good one too. <laughs> yeah, that could have gone. Uh, yeah, man, I don't even know. 
uh, what would pair really well with it? That's, I, I think too much on these kinds of questions. So <laughs> that's the kind of question, Casey, you need to give him ahead of time. I like to, I like to throw it right <laughs> out there, like just on the spot. Uh, yeah, that's that. I mean, that's the, if I don't want anyone asking me that question about any of my movies, I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I would pair with it. Um, yeah, yes. like Blair Witch would be one I would throw mm -hmm. out, or like, was it last year this came out? The Wretched, which is a really good. Uh, like set in the woods type of movie too uh, about another family story. I do have one now. I'm thinking about it. The ritual would probably be a good one to pair yes. with it. I think. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, just another people out in the woods being chased by something. That's it. Would be a good uh, pairing, I think. I like Even it. though I have mixed reviews on that movie, I like it and I don't. But it would be good with this, I think. Yeah, I like that pick, Brian. Do you have any? One besides, you know, what we've thrown out? No, because I mean, because the, the first two I think of when I'm just thinking of like in the woods kind of thing, whatnot, and maybe just a little bit different, you know, because sometimes, you know, you, you you do a double feature one of two ways. Either you do something same in line, like what you said with like Blair Witch and whatnot, or you go completely off the rails. And the first mm -hmm. thing my brain immediately went was like Cabin Fever, Tucker and Dale, uh, Cabin in the Woods. I thought about that one too, actually. <laughs> Because at least with Cabin in the so Woods, 50, you can pretty much 50, go anywhere. 50% of horror movies are set in the forest. So you're, you're throwing a, you know, you have a good chance of finding something that would pair great. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, there's already eight Jason movies. So, I mean, no, there's more than eight. Sorry. Me, there is 12 Jason movies. Yeah. But how many of them are in the woods? Like 10. Oh, I'll but, I'll but the one that he's in space. Or in Manhattan. He's barely. Hey, He's we're on a boat. On this, we're not getting into this conversation. Okay, actually, we are. Jason takes Manhattan. Good movie or not? All for the it's, just for the boxing. The the boxer alone is worth him going to Manhattan. Yeah, I think yeah the that scene, the <laughs> beheading scene. Jason oh, takes a boat to Manhattan. <laughs> All right, so let's let's kind of wrap this thing up uh, again. Duende is at the Black Hills Film Festival online this year. You can go check it out there. Uh, Dewey, do you have anything else you want to kind of plug or throw out there for people where they can find you, where, where else they uh, might be able to find the film besides the Black Hills Festival? Yeah. Um, well, I would say after the festival, because I'm I'm currently making it so you can only have to see it on the festival for now. But uh, after the festival's over, you'll be able to see it on my YouTube channel, which is just Mountain Films. Uh, I'm also doing a couple other... Um, I started with a friend of mine who helped me produce one day and he was integral in that. Uh, John Bates, he has a channel called difficult to look at pictures. Um, and we're starting this thing together called 93 second theater, where it's just a minute and a half shorts trying to just continue making films and do stuff that is interesting and keep our a 90 second out. short. Yeah. That sounds like it would be really easy and most you know, excruciating, painful, <laughs> try to fit everything into 90 seconds thing I could ever think of. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> I mean, the, it sounds shorts, like a good idea on paper. Right. The shorts aren't terrible. We already made two, but they're incredibly difficult to make. It's basically like a scene out of a movie kind of an idea. But yeah. All right. That's, that's awesome. So thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, if, if you want to, if you want to send us over the link when, when your, your film is up on YouTube so we can share it out, we'll share it out too. Sure. Let everybody get a chance to watch it. But if you do want to check it out again, Black Hills Film Festival, it is streaming on their website right now. But uh, again, Dewey, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having thank me. Thank you so much. Yeah.